The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. Welcome, guys, and happy Wednesday. Quite the world we're living in, and we're excited to be here talking to you about happy things and, more importantly than anything else, about dogs. But first, we're going to start with the quirky tip of the day. All right, why don't you give them the quirky tip of the day? I feel like we got a lot of different ways to segue you into optimism and a bright future, but the first way we found it was that series on TV, no? The James Altucher. Yeah. What yeah, was well, it called? Choose Yourself. Oh my gosh. So, you know. And there's a book written. He wrote a book first. I think he made this series for Netflix off of his book. Yeah. And I feel like we're like starting to go into like affiliate marketing on the podcast with books and movies and all these things, but we could all use all the positive energy that we can get right now. So we're dealing with everything in the world. We were in two weeks ago and we we're broadcasting for our happy podcast and we pre-recorded last week. Well, in the last two weeks, a lot has gone on. So we're trying to find other ways to segue our minds and our spirits and our bodies into happier places. So this Netflix series was awesome. And you've since downloaded the audiobook. Uh, um, yeah, well, you purchased that. Yeah, for me. I purchased that for Jess you. Jess is always steering me. In, oh, in the TED Talk it. is a great, easy, open. Like this is a great way to like figure out what the heck we're talking about today. Oh, is if, his TED Talk? If you're not familiar with yeah, uh, James, which Altucher. we weren't even until this week. So anyway, we can put a link in the bottom of the Facebook page or yeah, YouTube and page. He has a he has a four pronged approach to wellness is basically the bottom line. And if you look this guy up, he's a well known influencer and he has a good message. So the four pronged approach, you wanted to structure the podcast this way. And I thought it was a good idea. So we're going to apply his stuff to dogs. So we can not only deal with your wellness, but also the wellness of the animal. Yeah. I mean, he talks about the spiritual, physical, emotional, and mental aspects of his life and how he needed to get all four of those, um, things in alignment before he was feeling some peace and he dealt with a lot of depression and a lot of hassles and it was an interesting concept where he takes the physical body and he says how you need to take care of your heart you need to be heart healthy you don't want to get um, clogged arteries which leads to a heart attack and then he uses that analogy towards the emotional body the spiritual body and the mental body that if you're not exercising your 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 mind it's going to get clogged up and it's going to be non-productive. And he talks about there being like four different bloodstreams, which is a really interesting way to look at things. And if you look at dogs in this day and age, you know, even if you give them the best food, even if you exercise them um, the most optimum amount you can doing something really productive, even if you get the best genetics, we're still having a lot of fallout here with dogs and humans and everything else. So we're going to take his principles and apply them to the dog so the dog can have as much wellness as possible for itself and for hopefully for your family. Loose, and, loosely apply. Loosely. <laughs> this, yeah. is, this is our interpretation, but it was a positive thing in our life uh, from the last two weeks when we were in studio. We were trying to promote some positive things in your life, and hopefully moving forward, we can all just have a new step forward and just start feeling better because social media is a big sucker of our energy and our time and everything else, and James touches on that a lot about how he was working in Wall Street, how he was trying to be an influencer, and how he had a lot of burnout, and when he went low, it wasn't like, oh, I'm low, and like I just got to get back up and try again. Like Low sucks. It sucks to be low, and we're all experiencing different lows no matter what's going on in our lives with our world today. So, Talking one, about... I just want to say one last thing about him that I enjoyed was... We love him. We might just talk about him and never well, talk about Well, making dogs. the most of your um, fail of your shortcomings. Yes. So if Embracing happen, them. If you happen to be a procrastinator, instead of getting on this bandwagon of, I'm not going to procrastinate anymore and trying to fight against that nature of procrastinating, he says, well, why don't you make a list of 10 things about procrastinating that work in your favor? Let's start to look for the silver lining in your shortcomings. And I think it's even That's in his TED Talk. He's yeah. like, how, ma how much have you complained today? Who have you been around that complained today? Like, how has that affected you? And he says, you know, like, it could even be, you know, oh, you got on the wrong bridge, honey, so we're going to be late to this TED Talk by James Altucher. And then he says, which is like, so Jess, and my heart just melts. He's like, what if you thought about how grateful it is to live in a city with so much infrastructure and to get around on the outside of the city from the bridge? Like, it's just a sweet way to look no, at he things. Says, so many people love this city 
that I'm in the middle of this traffic around all these other people that love this city as even, much as I do. Even our own interpretations of the same thing. We're, <clears throat> we're like living in America right now. Okay, so anyway, let's talk so how does this about apply to a dog? the dogs. I know. Well, you talked about the plant analogy, which well, I my, think is good. My first thought about today's topic was going to be just the very simple living with a dog, which to me, that's like my favorite topic. When I was thinking about that on the way to, to the podcast today, living with dogs is something I've done consistent, consistently since, you know, it's been well over 20 years now and um, never considered not living with a dog. It doesn't even enter my mind. Maybe it, living with fewer. There's been many situations where my life has been less comfortable because I own a dog. Living situations, housing, there's many things where it's more difficult to own a dog than to be by yourself, for sure. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of responsibility and there's a lot of physical needs that a dog has. You know, and we're going to take that four-pronged approach and not only facet it into the logistics of owning a dog, but how you can actually make your dog as well and well-rounded as it possibly can be. Like that's a really important thread here that uh, we have tried to connect the dots for you. So talking about the physical and tell, tell me a little bit about your plant analogy because you talked about caring well, for plants. Well, I enjoy uh, growing plants and I've been growing cannabis for the past I don't know, on and off for the past few years since it's been legal in, in the states that I've lived in, and I just thought it was a fun little hobby to get into. But the the care of a plant, I mean, you need to make sure it's fed, it's watered, that it's not getting too much sunlight, that it's getting enough sunlight. It needs attention. It needs daily check-in, just some attention. A lot of people have a hard time with that, and the plants all die. So if you can't keep a house plant alive, you may not be a great candidate to be owning a dog or goldfish or any other living thing. So that's the base some primal basic, level some of Some basic that. requirements. And it is true. Like, Scott always jokes, like, if you want a dog, like, get a stuffed animal first or, like, just an app that cuddles with you. Like, it is a lot to own a dog and there's a lot of logistics. So most of you listening right now are past the logistical You part. already have dogs. Yeah, but if you want to talk about that physical aspect of your dog, that's what we're talking about. Like, James says it, eat, move, sleep. So I think that's a really good way of thinking about it. Like, you need to eat healthy things, you need to move your body, and you need to get good sleep. So when you translate that to a dog... You're going to look at their feeding. Like, what are they eating? What is their diet? You're going to look at how much exercise they're getting. Is it appropriate exercise? Are they getting exercise with structure? Is it when you go to the beach, the dog runs like completely out of his mind, doesn't even know you exist for two hours and then goes home. That necessarily, even though it's, it's feeding the physical body, that necessarily isn't helping the four-pronged approach. You want to think about if it may not be helping sick. the mental game. Yeah. yeah. If you want to, you want to think about if the dog gets sick, this is a physical thing going on now. This is a huge thing for me because knowing how my dogs act day in, day out, and then seeing a change with them, that makes me think, oh, like maybe something's up and I can start tweeting things apart. I dislocated my knee it's going on a month and a week now, a five weeks. So things have been different. Scott's been having to do a lot of stuff that Scott hasn't been used, used to doing in the house. We've moved dogs downstairs. All the dogs are experiencing it differently. Like I, for the most part, am the yeah. dog caretaker and I can't do that anymore. And small things are happening. What I were you going to say? say I, I never realized a dog could go without water for <laughs> five, six days. <laughs> Scott's learning a lot about how things can be. So we have all these little nuances going on in our house, right? Like a dog is more thirsty. Last night, Gigi, the dog that was on the podcast for the Joan Ranquette animal communication episode, she was like charged out of her mind. I don't know if it's the energy of the world. I don't know what's going on, but I'm like, get on a bed, lay down. I made her lay down. She's like all ready to go. I gave her more food. I'm like a pet dog owner now trying to acquiesce my 13 year old Pomeranian. So she shuts up, but the dogs are all acting differently. And if I didn't know a lot about their physical body, meaning like, okay, if Gigi gets tuna, she's going to have diarrhea. If if she doesn't get this probiotic, this is going to happen. If she has a patch of hair, she's going to lose all her hair. If I didn't know more about all my dog's physical bodies, I may not be able to say like, huh, that goes beyond the physical. There's a behavioral component. Maybe something actually is going on. Dogs puke sometimes out of stress. They have loose stool sometimes out of stress. Like there's different things that contribute to everything. And rather than always rushing to the vet or throwing the dogs on metronidazole every time something happens, the more you're looking at the dogs from this four-pronged approach, I think the more it'll be about their wellness in the overall view. Do you have anything else to say about the physical body? I think that probably for most people listening to this podcast, they're very in tune. I'd like to think they're in tune with their dog's physical health. But if you have a busy family and, you know, you got kids you're chasing around and there's a dog in there too, take a moment, you know, it would be ideally it'd be great once a day, but if you could do it a couple times a week, just put your hands over that dog's whole body, mm -hmm. you know, just check the paws, look in the ears. We have a dog that's been scratching a little bit more lately. Mm -hmm. We check the ears, 
they're dirty, they don't smell terrible, but they're on their way to possibly an ear infection. They need to be addressed. Little and things like and that. there's dryness going on. We're having dryness. Yeah, very like, dry. There's, and honest to God, I mean, if you haven't watched the Home Remedies podcast, literally between apple cider vinegar and coconut oil and uh, a little bit of good energy from your hands, you can probably fix most things going on. And the other last thing I want to say about the physical is normally when you're focusing on the dog's physical, think of how it translates to your physical. So like I get a lot more bang for my buck, if you will, going for a walk with my dogs and having the dogs like in the woods with me and I'm in the woods also. If you're putting a dog on the treadmill and you're just scrolling through your social media feeds, maybe how can you change that so it can be more about you too? We were even talking about that with um, Scott with the physical exercise. He puts Cousteau on the treadmill. So he bought these things with James. Why don't you intro these and then we'll get into the other three. Yeah, one of the things that, you know, it was kind of fun to see and it was, it was funny and silly, but productive. You could see the value in it is this guy, James Altucher. He makes, he decided to start making a list of 10 creative ideas a day. It could relate to anything. It could be 10 ways to exercise my dog. It could be 10 new business ideas. It could be anything. And he said he started, he got these, these uh, waiter pads because they were like 10 cents a piece. And he, first thing in the morning, he got up and this is when he was at his lowest low. So he didn't have things to do ahead of time. He'd wake up in the morning and he'd make a list of things to do for that day. And he said, just by writing it down, it held him more accountable because now he's got the list. Next thing is, let's start checking off this crap and getting it done. Now he's becoming more productive. His big thing is, and I like these little, like to me, this is something very doable in my life, 10, just 10 things. But it isn't easy because he said the first four or five come easy. The last three or four on the list are really hard. And he really talks about hard. this idea muscle and exercising it. And if you guys listen to the podcast at all, you've heard Scott talk to different guests we've had on about writing, about his own writing journey. Scott, it, he's actually a brilliant writer. He has done a few blog posts. And when he expresses himself, he's brilliant. But he has a lot of stories to tell and he has a lot of things to do. This is a very attainable way for him to flex his idea muscle. But it's a lot more productive if his dog's on the treadmill for 20 minutes and exercising his physical body. Body, to have this in the room with the treadmill than his phone. So just consider those little things when you're dealing with your dog's physical. I was going to say, this ties into your mental, his mental. You know, he's got the physical aspects, the mental aspects, work in the mind. But you can start focusing these things towards uh, a dog-centric lifestyle is what I was thinking. Yeah, right? completely. And if your dog can be healthy and you can be healthy, great. Okay, so we've only done physical. We're a little bit behind. We got mental, emotional, and spiritual. And we're going to talk to you guys about it after the break. We will see you then. What makes Coranda Beds chew-proof? Only Coranda beds have a patented design which secures the fabric inside the frame, making it totally inaccessible to jaws and paws. Your dog can't chew the fabric because we've hidden the edges inside the rails. Dogs love Coranda beds. See why? Coranda beds come in a variety of custom sizes. You can even add a fleece pad on top for extra coziness. And these beds can be used both indoors and outdoors. But best of all, our beds are easy to clean. Just wipe them off or hose them down. Visit dogbed.us slash the quirky dog for more details. All right, we are back. So we've covered the physical, we got the mental, we got the spiritual, and we got the emotional to go. So these are a little bit of a stretch. And mostly for us, we had a really hard time coming up with emotional because of the way James uh, segues things for people and dogs. But anyway, we're talking mental. So with mental, the way Scott and I think about that, and you just touched on this um, before we went to break, is is it good for the dog's mind? So like we like the treadmill for dog's headspace, and we talk about this all the time, because not only is the dog having to get exercise and go for a walk, but they're thoughtful of every movement. If they're just out in the yard for two hours, they're not necessarily in the moment or thoughtful or making necessarily good decisions. They may be acting more on instinct. If they're just out in the woods running around on a long line with reckless abandon, maybe that was really good for them physically, but maybe their mental state is getting looser and looser and looser. So the mental stuff for us was more like games, training, structure. Um, and I said, and I think you agreed with me, I don't know if this was the case or not, but that to me, most of your sources of behavioral problems are going to stem from the mental. Yes. So yeah, I think we agreed on that. Yeah, yeah. So we, you were talking like, all right, so your dog's mentally bored, right? It's a rainy day. 
All right, stuff a Kong. Give them a peanut butter with Kong, stuff it with yogurt, freeze it. Gigi, the little Pomeranian, gets bones every morning. She has a little marrow bone. I put yogurt in it. I refreeze it. I put sweet potato in it. I refreeze it. Like, fine, if it's going to be a rainy day and you can't run your dogs, give them something productive to do. Nose work is a great thing, I would say. Um, having your dogs, teaching them different search games and stuff is really productive to the dog to be able to go to like, okay, like I'm working through these boxes. I'm really thinking. They're way more tired normally after five minutes of nose work than a 15-minute walk where they're just dragging you down the street. Um, training, I would say training is definitely a, mental a game. huge mental game. And it helps the physical because they yes. have to actually move around. Like when you're, when you feel like, okay, box is checked. Like, here we go. Like dog's physical body, the box is checked. I could not be doing more. They're on an amazing food. They see the best vets. Everything's great. Head right to the mental and see how your physical and your mental are tying together. Training needs to have a purpose. Okay. So I've been talking a lot to uh, one of my good friends, brothers and he, his buddy got a dog and COVID and everything. And they've been talking to me about, you know, how are we going to deal with this dog and what are we going to do? They had a positive trainer that came and said, I'm going to give you a base rate for the year and you'll get unlimited classes for the year. I don't know what that was. I'm not knocking that positive trainer. I try to be very fair as giving credit to positive where it's due and giving credit to balance where it's due. But can you imagine being like, like I cannot, I don't know what that price would be. Maybe that's going to be my new program. <laughs> Yeah, for I guess for 2021. Us, if you would like to pay us $175,000, Scott will see you endlessly. For, like, I don't know. I don't even know how you come up with that price point. But my thinking with that is, okay, they gave her a price. They gave the guy a price point and it was unlimited for a year. Well, what's actually happening with that? You know, I said, we were FaceTiming. I'm like, hey, show me the dog sitting. The dog sits in the kitchen for two minutes. That doesn't mean the dog's sitting on the street. That doesn't mean the dog's sitting on a walk. That doesn't mean any of this. So like, what is... What you're doing with the dog mentally through training should actually cross over into real life. And I'm not even saying that sarcastically. Like, I'm truly not. People will call us and say, oh, but I took a puppy class at Petco when the dog was, you know, a puppy and I did an eight-week class and, like, everything's not okay. Or people will say, oh, I hired a trainer. We worked with trainers. Oh, yeah, we tried medication. Okay, we'll try behaviorists. Like, what about the training that you learned? Is it actually moving into society? Like, that's honestly just the A number one thing. If you have fear, like ev everything that's going on, like your training needs to translate. I like uh, that training needs to translate. Well, I would say, uh, you know, on a more productive line of commenting here that just working on your come command in a structured way two or three times a week is addressing the physical and the mental at the same time. You know, it's, they get to run, they get to be excited and run to you. And uh, you're making it a positive experience, I would assume. And when the dog gets to you, they have to sit. There's, there's a little well, thing, that ha there's things that have to happen there. Yeah. Well, my point is this, there's criteria associated with this exercise. And it's also exercise in the sense that the dog gets to run at the same time. So something as simple as that would be addressing a couple of these issues right out of the gate. Yeah, for sure. And I just, I'm going to go back to my unproductive line of commenting. Okay. But um, as far as the mental goes, like we said, if behavioral problems are happening with you, whether it be anxiety, fear, anything else, and you don't understand where that's coming from, then you literally need to think and kind of reevaluate things and be like, okay, how can I do better? How can I do better for myself, my family, and my dog? And I'm not blaming you, but I'm just saying that's how we are looking at mental. Blaming so who? now Me, you? Who, who we I'm blaming? blaming you for clearing your throat. Okay. okay. So now we're going into emotional and this was what was tricky for us. And I really have a hard time with this thought process and this line of thinking. Um, so we don't know how the dog is feeling emotionally ever. Like we really don't. I, it's not, of course we know our dogs and we can be like, oh, he's bummed out. Like, oh, he feels crappy. Like, oh, he's high as a kite. Like we can say different things about looking at them, but we don't truly know how they're feeling. And the problem with dogs is dogs can't speak to us. So we don't truly know what's going on inside of them. I always use this analogy. If you're a psychologist or a psychiatrist and you put someone in a glass box for an hour and you observe them and then you medicate them, that's highly unethical. Like people aren't promoting that, but we're doing that with dogs. So anyway, and that's and, you know, totally separate and that's totally fine. I'm not saying that there's no need for medication, but that type of situation is happening more and more and more. What think, were you going to say on that? I think sometimes um, dogs aren't capable of being honest with their feelings. And you could argue that, well, they're, they're animals, so they, have, they can only be honest. But you can see a dog that all of a sudden starts acting fearful if the person that it's with is reinforcing a fear. Yes, behavior. or if they don't want to do something. They start to go back to this, oh, when I act like this and I act right. scared, then they'll back off and I won't have to get my harness put on. That's what I mean. And, and the hard part, I guess, between you and I with the mental-emotional was 
a, a true fear response. To me, that's an emotional response as a human when I say a fear response. Yes, to me, it's an and, emotional thing. But to me, if Scott and I were saying fear response and we were evaluating what a fear response was, that's one thing. Sometimes an owner evaluating a fear response, that can be biased. So anyway, when we were talking about emotional, really the only two things we came up with is how are the owner's emotions affecting the dog, which was really kind of like the bulk of it. And that's the bulk of a lot of what we talk about in our podcast and in our in-person training and in our online stuff and yada, yada, yada. So that's a, a trending theme with Scott and Jess and everything all together. And then I thought like, also you could do your environment. So like obviously a dog that's in a shelter with 80 other dogs and hasn't had a ton of human interaction, maybe outside of some volunteer care, that dog probably could be bummed out. So you could say, all right, that dog who's been living here for three years, who's in the back of the shelter, who looks really, really sad, and he doesn't even have a great appetite. He goes into a family with, you know, kids and he's thriving and he does great. You can see a, a big change in emotional stuff there. So we were talking about that, but let's talk about how the owner's emotions can impact the dog. Well, I would, if you don't know already, I would say that dogs tend to reflect our emotional state of being. Uh, that being said, uh, if you tend to be a little more anxious uh, and have anxiety issues, your dog obviously will be a little more anxious, things like and that. And that's so, not to call people out. No, and that's no, that's, not just, to that's just the way dogs, that's just the way dogs yeah, behave. It's not about the people. That's the way energy works. When Scott's batshit, that's wearing off on me. Vice versa, but he's a lot more resilient than me, and he's good about putting up his emotional shield to not well, bring in the, my crazy. My, my batshit doesn't bother me. <laughs> Your bad shit is why you're still alive. <laughs> but really, like this is this is just these are facts of life. Like you're sitting there and you have worry about what's going on. Your dog senses that. That is a thing. Why is Gigi crazy? Why are the dogs drinking more water? Probably because of the world and me and everything freaking going on right now. So outside of that, like just acknowledge that for what it is and think, okay, if I want to help my dog and I think that my dog is more fearful or more anxious or X, Y, Z because of really, it doesn't matter. Why don't I try to help myself, get myself grounded, get myself in a good emotional state and see if there's any carryover to the dog. And I would say we see that a lot with our animals and when we used to have a big kennel and everything else. Yeah, it's even dogs being next to each other. We mm -hmm. own dogs that literally need to be like on separate floors because that one's energy is so batty that it sets the other one off. And if mm -hmm. you think that's crazy and if you think it doesn't exist, I can literally give you a hundred examples. I'll start on my little guest check notepad and go through it. But literally dogs licking their paws, dogs scratching, dogs pacing, dogs panting. All of these little things can be behavioral things and you have to be aware of it. All right, so we're on our fourth topic. Uh, do you have anything else to say about emotional? Because I don't want to squash your voice. Well, I appreciate that. I don't want to censor Scott. I, for me, emotional is more about what the owner is feeling and projecting inadvertently onto their dog that they should just be conscious of, rather than trying to look at your dog and say, is he happy or sad today, and jumping through hoops trying to make I guess that's happen. the thing. Like, I don't know the last time I said to you, like, oh... Chew seems really sad, or oh, Vital seems elated today. Probably like our dogs are other just, day. yeah, yeah. <laughs> J Jimmy's used to like never going in a crate now. Um, our dogs are just who they are, and like we're not overanalyzing that or anything else. And we're certainly not like, oh, they look sad. Okay, let's pick up the leash and take them for a hike. Let's make them happier. Like trying to freaking segue your life around your dog's happiness sometimes can make you jump through more uh, hole loopholes than you want to. It's making you jump through more hoops than maybe is necessary. All right, so for spiritual. So this was another one that was controversial. I mean, really, you can only carry over mental and physical yeah, I, to the dog. I but, think the dogs are spiritual beings uh, to begin with, just as they exist. And all we're, you know, the more we try to squash, squash them. them into a box, you know, the harder it is for them to be the spiritual creature that they are, in a sense. That was very poetic, what you said. So I and was free going Free the to dogs, <laughs> baby. Free the dogs. Oh, my God. Now we're going to get PETA friggin' backlash. Hey, okay. maybe they'll give us a little bump. <laughs> <laughs> the quirky dog sponsored by PETA. I swear that will never happen. I promise. Okay. Don't close so, the door on anything. Uh, I'm closing the door. I'm going to start. So no tickling on the podcast. I'm starting to close the door um, on a few things here lately in the world. Okay. So spiritual, the way that I wanted to take that and the way that I thought that that would be like, oh, kind of like a nice way to look at it. And what I saw is like a dog that's in the zone. Okay. So we can talk about like a dog in Scotland that's literally like working a sheep farm and has an actual job there and serves a function on the farm. And when that dog is hurting, I guarantee you that is 
as close to a spiritual experience for the dog as possible. And can I say, I guarantee you, because I say we don't know what dogs are feeling with emotion. No. So I don't know how they're experiencing spirituality either. But in my mind, that's it. An agility dog that loves agility. They're in the zone. You don't do sports with your dog. No problem. A dog who's trusty off leash in the woods. That is like a spiritual experience. I would say we just had a client the other day. We took the dog. Um, he is a very dear client. He's had a very hard road and him and his dog are doing great, but we brought him and his dog to the dog park and his favorite thing to see is his dog running loose in the dog park. And guys, I get it. Like we're not crazy dog park. There were only five dogs there at a time. We were just there for training. It was just one there dog wasn't in any there, dogs there when but we were he there. just likes to take his dog off leash. He didn't want to use e collar with the dog. He is dealing with some mechanical issues himself. He gets to the dog park, he lets his dog off leash, and he could literally sob. He is so happy to see his dog running through and this dog, dog park. And the dog came back. <laughs> <laughs> dog came back a half a dozen times. But he, he just, he loves. The dog's picking up toys. It's running around. Like, that is probably, if not a spiritual experience for the dog, a for little both. bit of a spiritual for experience both. for him. So, for sure. like, if you're not feeling this fulfillment when you're living with dogs, which is, I would say, the highest privilege any of us have at this point. I just wanted to add without Okay, hold on. You. I just want to close yeah, I didn't the want to thought. You. Um, if you're not feeling these types of privileges and these types of experiences, check out the James Altucher Choose Yourself book or series or even TED Talk. That's the closest one. And then think about some of the things he says as they relate to people. And then think about some of the things we said and how you can expand on that and relate that to your dog. Do you one still One thing remember? I like about him, one thing I like, well, a few, a lot of things I liked about him, but he doesn't bring up, he's apol apolitical. He doesn't get into politics. He doesn't get into religion. Mm -hmm. And he's just kind of a self fixer. Can you imagine had kind of we a, not done well, that? It's kind of a nice change of pace, you know. But, but um, what was I going to say? Oh, I was going to say, uh, in conclusion to the spiritual, if we're closing in on it, that this past fall I had dogs lying out in the grass. I was smoking a cigar. They were laying in the leaves and they were looking like they were having a spiritual experience. <laughs> <laughs> just hanging out and just laying there in the grass, you know? Maybe it was the cigar smoke. Maybe it was the air. We don't know. But guys. I think they're always at that level of uh, enlightenment, if you want to call it that. Yeah, you, you, do, you do. do give dogs a lot of credit. And they are. They This is why they More heal people. people. This is sure. why they heal through <laughs> therapy work. This is why they heal through service work. This is why they help a, in law enforcement. I'm afraid they're going to be able to read a dog's mind pretty soon. They're going to be telling us <laughs> stories we don't want to be hearing. Or, or they'll say that they can and they'll tell us hmm. what they want us to hear. Anyway, you guys. 2021 started kind of a rough start. I'm not going to be a believer of let me turn in my seven day subscription or whatever subscription it is at this point, three weeks subscription. Rough start. Um, enough is enough. At what we're looking for now is moving forward, putting our best foot forward and doing that for your dogs too. So if you need a studio at the quirky dog.com, we will see you next week. And in the meantime, keep it quirky and choose yourself, right? That's it guys. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.